AI in general. So uh, one thing that uh, uh, I believe is that uh, even though uh, the Moore's law appears to be, uh, you know, the ending, but uh, uh, many many of the uh, the interesting innovations are just beginning to happen. Especially uh, now, we're actually uh, getting to the point where uh, we're going to be triggering some very uh, exciting uh, uh, um, changes in terms of interconnect and storage. And um, that also uh, would uh, uh, back pressure some of the changes that we will need to make to the compute architecture and uh, so that we can uh, you know, begin to reap the benefit of these uh, you know, the interesting developments. So let me maybe uh, first uh, start with some challenges in large scale machine learning today. And we already heard some of the, uh, you know, the, these changes from the previous talk, so I'm not going, not going to uh, dwell on them too, uh, too much, but I wanted to kind of use them to set the context of the talk, so for the talk. So one of the, uh, the uh, big uh, problems that we're going to be facing is this whole uh, you know, the concept that the most valuable data sets are distributed across institutions or even individuals. Um, so, uh, so uh, you know, the, when we, uh, you know, during the first keynote, Man, uh, Manish also uh, talked about this a little bit about uh, how we can, you know, train the models with a very highly distributed data set uh, without uh, exposing some of the privacy uh, information. So, the, you know, in general, uh, the industry is uh, probably moving towards uh, what we call the multi-party computing infrastructure for data owners to collaboratively train model for many of us to contribute our data into the training process, but without revealing uh, the details of our personal uh, data. So the second one is, you know, the uh, labeling very large data set is difficult, if not feasible. And the, the research community has been, you know, the, 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 uh, working on various ways, such as, you know, reinforcement learning, such as, you know, the, some clever ways of generating uh, labels, uh, you know, based on uh, the, uh, some assumptions about the data. And this is not going to be uh, the, uh, the main topic of my presentation either, but I wanted to make sure that we keep this in mind. That is, uh, even though we're going to be talking about processing extremely large data set in, uh, you know, I would say uh, in uh, you know, uh, several different sparse versus random kind of access patterns, we still need to keep in mind that uh, you know, there are other very important uh, research topics that need to be uh, addressed in order for you know, the, this whole field to, you know, to really come together. Now, uh, we did hear also from uh, you know, the, one of the talks that uh, 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 natural language processing and recommendation uh, models are often too large to fit into memory. And um, so th this is a, a fairly common problem, and it's becoming more and more of a problem. And so this need to, you know, the, uh, to, uh, uh, to the point that we need to avoid model loading, and uh, we need to begin to provide fast access to very large amount of memory. And this is going to be uh, part of what I'm going to talk about today. And then, uh, you know, the, the, I think there's also a kind of a subtle uh, you know, the challenge that uh, uh, many of us are beginning to see, that is, you know, the explainability and accountability requirements are the pushing us to use massive online data during inference. So the, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, uh, it, we need to uh, be able to, you know, the, to very, uh, in real time often, uh, access some uh, vast amount of data to uh, look for uh, corrupt, uh, corroborating evidence uh, that would uh, support the inference result from neural networks and so on. And uh, these kind of data accesses, in my opinion, will become uh, increasingly uh, uh, prominent in uh, edge computing, in uh, you know, uh, cloud computing, so that uh, you know, the, uh, the neural network inferences can be actually backed up and scrutinized with some uh, real, real data uh, you know, the uh, cooperation and uh, uh, so that we can, you know, to have a more accountability and explainability. So with these things in mind, uh, you know, the, I, I just kind of quickly introduced the IBM Illinois C3SR. It was created in 2016 
And um, uh, it's de designed to create game-changing AI technologies and systems. And uh, we aim to uh, build systems that can provide sub-millisecond uh, response time for AI applications that can augment uh, human capability. And the Manish, you know, said it really, really well this morning. You know, the uh, the, the real value of these AI systems is to be able to uh, augment human. And then, uh, so we so far we have published more than 150 top uh, uh, AI and system conference papers, and uh, we innovate uh, in the AI application uh, you know, uh, domain, the task libraries and platform tools and hardware. We mainly take a cross-stack approach uh, so that uh, we can you know, have the freedom to adjust and uh, innovate in different levels of the stack in order to, uh, to achieve our goals. And um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, this, is, uh, this center support currently supports 24 faculty members, Jinjin and I. Uh, Jinjin is the IBM co-director, and I am the uh, Illinois co-director. And uh, we have a very wide range of uh, you know, uh, the real uh, leading experts, uh, all the way uh, from the natural language processing, image processing, down to the uh, you know, the, uh, the very hardware, uh, you know, uh, uh, deep level hardware expertise, all the way down to the, uh, the uh, flash technology, FPGA technology, and so on. So uh, let me just kind of uh, start the system aspect uh, with a kind of a simplified view uh, of the a NOAA system for IBM uh, with both a, a V100 GPUs today. And this is actually this, uh, you know, the kind of system that uh, uh, Sarita was alluding to earlier uh, this morning. So uh, you know, the, uh, in this particular configuration, uh, we will have two GPUs per, uh, you know, the per, per CPU socket. And the GPUs have about uh, 14 teraflops of, uh, sing, uh, of uh, single precision uh, floating point throughput. It uh, can access HBM, uh, which has a capacity of 16 gigabytes, per, uh, 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 not per second, but just gigabytes. And then uh, uh, it can be accessed with a bandwidth of about, about 900 gigabytes per second. And um, uh, this you know, system in itself is a, uh, is a very much a breakthrough system because this is one of the early uh, you know, uh, systems with HBM technology. And um, uh, so uh, this uh, actually pr provided about three times jump in terms of memory, uh, you know, the bandwidth compared to the first of the previous generation, which is probably the biggest jump recorded in history, uh, in the whole history of uh, DRAM uh, usage. And then uh, uh, there's another unique uh, you know, the, uh, capability, which is the GPUs are connected to the CPUs with the NVLink, and uh, as Sarita uh, alluded to. And uh, so this gives about 80 gigabyte per second bandwidth uh, you know, to the GPU, uh, to the CPU. And um, this has a very interesting implication because uh, the interconnect to the CPU is approaching the, uh, the CPU memory bandwidth uh, you know, the, in that system. So theoretically, one can begin to to use the host memory. Uh, in this case, uh, it's up to about 100 gigabytes, and uh, uh, a few hundred gigabytes. And uh, the system that we have is a half uh, terabyte uh, memory system. So this provides a substantial extension to the GPU memory, even though it's you know, uh, even only one-tenth of the bandwidth of the HBM, but it's already approaching the traditional CPU uh, memory bandwidth. Therefore, uh, you know, the, the, some of the schemes that Sarita was talking about in terms of swapping and so on can actually work. Otherwise, there's no chance that uh, the, this kind of arrangement can work. So the system is already enabling some of the innovative uh, software arrangements to be able to, you know, to really uh, make use of very large amount of data uh, in, uh, in memory. So uh, here, so uh, just kind of put things into perspective, uh, if we look at uh, uh, the compute versus memory bandwidth, um, you know, we can, if we want to fully saturate uh, the compute, uh, you know, the throughput of VOTA, um, given the HBM uh, memory bandwidth, uh, 
but which is very impressive. Uh, we still need to uh, be able to, you know, to uh, reuse the, the every uh, uh, operand that we fetch from the HBM uh, 62.3 times, so that we can uh, we can fully utilize the Volta compute throughput. And this is uh, nearly impossible, uh, except for some very specialized uh, you know, computations, such as dense matrix matrix multiplication. And this is the reason why you know, everything is formulated as a matrix, uh, matrix multiplication. So the, uh, the convolution layer to these days are formulated with, uh, into uh, you know, dense matrix matrix multiplication. And, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 and then uh, even the fully connected layers are formulated into matrix matrix multiplication by batching uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the inputs. So, so these are uh, the the critical part is to be able to reuse the data enough times to be able to do so. And but the, uh, once we get to the host, uh, if we start to use the host memory as the main memory, then uh, in order to fully utilize the Volta uh, compute throughput, we will need to reuse the operand about seven hundred times. And this is exactly the reason why uh, you know, the software has to be incredibly uh, well crafted to be able to swap the data in and out of the, uh, the GPU memory. And every piece of data that got swapped into the GPU memory has to be reused 700 times so that uh, we can keep the, uh, the GPU uh, operate uh, you know, the fully occupied. And um, uh, obviously, uh, you know, th this is a very uh, difficult uh, task, and um, uh, you know, the, any practical system will likely have a much, much lower uh, usage of the compute throughput. Today, uh, if you are unfortunate and uh, have to get your data from the flash memory, and the, the flash memory is typically you know, connected uh, to the uh, CPU, uh, through the uh, 16 gigabyte per second PCIe 3 uh, x16 kind of uh, you know, interconnect. Uh, if you do a x4, then uh, the, uh, you know, the, um, the bandwidth will be uh, further reduced. So assuming a high-end PCIe interconnect into the system, uh, we're talking about uh, somewhere around 16 uh, gigabyte per second bandwidth. And that means that uh, if we want to be able to use the flash effectively for, uh, and, and saturate the uh, Volta compute throughput, every operand that, that gets uh, swapped into the Volta system need to be reused 3,500 times or so to be able to sustain that, uh, uh, that uh, the throughput. So this is what we have today. And then we have all kinds of frameworks and uh, you know, uh, uh, runtimes and so on to, you know, to try to use the system. In about a year, the world is going to be quite different. Um, so this is kind of a uh, hypothetical system with the newly announced Ampere uh, GPUs from NVIDIA. And uh, Jason Huang just uh, did a keynote uh, you know, uh, last week and uh, announced the Ampere GPUs. And um, so you know, the, uh, it's not uh, difficult to imagine you know, how the uh, next uh, system will probably look like. So uh, you know, the, uh, I think uh, Sarita already mentioned uh, something like uh, you know the, uh, we, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the system that we have access you know, to today can go up to about 150 gigabyte per second. That's actually combining three 50 gigabyte per second links, uh, you know, into the, uh, you know, the uh, uh, six, uh, sorry, six, uh, 25 gigabyte per second links into, uh, you know, together. And uh, for the next generation, these links are going to increase to 50 gigabyte per second. So when you combine those uh, six links, uh, you can get about 300 gigabyte per second. And now we're looking at some very, very interesting bandwidth, right, uh, you know, in, into the uh, components. And then, uh, you know, the, I can imagine that uh, people will probably not uh, continue to build point-to-point -point systems <laughs> because at some point, uh, when you have, you know, <clears throat> all these links, and um, uh, if you need to build point-to-point -point systems, you need to split up these links so that you can provide enough of the type topology in the system. And um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, 
even higher value approach is to provide a switch uh, in, the, uh, in the center so that the, the uh, pairwise uh, communication between the GPU and the, uh, the host, the GPU and the storage, and so on, and the GPU and GPU can fully utilize all the 300 gigabytes per second whenever there is a critical link that needs the data. So this gives a very, very interesting you know, uh, uh, scenario when it comes to handling very large amount of data. Um, you know, for, for one thing, uh, the, the, uh, the bandwidth that we can have to the uh, DDR host memory um, is now probably going to be higher than the regular DRAM channels. And the, of course, the CPUs will begin to have, uh, you know, the, be, begin to have HBM as well. However, keep in mind, uh, when CPUs use HBM, uh, the capacity is going to have exactly the same limitation as the GPU memory. So uh, for most CPUs, the traditional DDR system will be there and they will you know, remain at uh, you know, the, the size of, you know, I would say, probably hundreds of gigabytes, per set, uh, uh, gigabytes of capacity. And another very, very interesting uh, you know, the, uh, scenario that we're looking at is that we are now looking at, first time in the history, looking at uh, a hundreds of gigabyte per second bandwidth that we can potentially have to the storage. And the storage can be anywhere from a few terabytes to even petabyte of data. So obviously, uh, when we have the, uh, you know, the bandwidth into the storage, uh, we will be able to, you know, the, to begin to think about data uh, you know the uh, uh, machine learning and the uh, you know data mining and uh, and so on in a very very different way. And um, uh, on the other hand, we still will be uh, able, need to be very careful about the concept of uh, I/O amplification. Uh, currently, the way that we get a high bandwidth uh, you know, out of the storage is by accessing very large chunk of data. And then we load them into the host memory, we sort them out, we rent, if we need to random, randomize uh, the training order of uh, APATS, you know, we sort it out in the, in the host memory and so on. But um, you know, the, when we start to think about you know, terabytes or the, you know, petabytes of data that we're going to try to you know, the randomly use to, to, uh, to train the models, we probably will not be uh, looking at you know, the, uh, loading the data in huge chunks into the DDR. And we probably should begin to think about how we can support very large number of small, smaller uh, order of several K bytes of uh, accesses, but thousands and thousands of them so that uh, we can take advantage of the bandwidth and uh, uh, you know, the use that as a uh, use the bandwidth as the uh, new weapon to be able to uh, to pump the uh, data in the right kind of order and the right kind of patterns into our machine learning system. So there are some interesting implications that I'm you know predicting here uh, for the next few years. Uh, the future clusters will continue to consist of fat nodes, and um, uh, so these uh, nodes will be, uh, become even fatter because the capabilities of the interconnect is so much uh, you know, more than the, uh, you know, the, than the, uh, the, uh, the infiniband uh, based uh, switches and interconnects, the gap between the local communication and remote communication will continue to widen. So this means that more and more of the software will begin to have to you know, uh, uh, resort to hierarchical communication patterns in order to, you know, the, in order to to, to manage that uh, huge gap. And uh, it's already happening to some degree in today's system, but uh, my prediction is it will become prevalent uh, in the future. And then uh, one can begin to treat the storage as very large, long latency memory. And uh, a lot of the things that we used to do in the host memory will likely be done in the storage. But this requires us to, you know, to be able to support the storage access in very different ways. And um, we need to begin to enable finer grain uh, storage accesses, and we need to have new architecture features uh, to, uh, in the processors and interconnects to be able to support it. And I would like to spend the next few slides discussing some of these 
you know, the, uh, require some of these uh, you know, challenges. So uh, you know, let, uh, let me first just you know, uh, talk about the hierarchical communication. Um, the, the hierarchical communication means that uh, you know, we will try to, you know, the, uh, when we exchange data among a large number of, let's say, MPI ranks, um, instead of doing a flat communication, uh, we, uh, we, we, we you know, take advantage of the fact that uh, uh, within the cluster, uh, within the node, uh, there's a much, much higher uh, communication bandwidth. So uh, we can first do a reduction, uh, you know, for, for a all reduce, we can do first do a reduction inside the, uh, the, uh, the node before uh, we start to communicate uh, with outside. So all the nodes will first reduce and then, uh, you know, they will uh, communicate. So uh, this could be very useful for, for example, uh, you know, the gradient, uh, you know, all reduce uh, of uh, gradients in the uh, training uh, you know, the, uh, of neural networks. So uh, here is a recent result that, um, uh, you know, I don't directly work on training, and, but uh, I was uh, collaborating with the Argonne uh, National Lab in reconstructing the X-ray CT uh, you know, the data uh, for uh, you know, brain uh, cell, uh, brain interconnect studies and chip uh, you know, reverse engineering. So these are not your typical X-ray uh, CT pictures uh, for uh, from your doctor's office. These are the uh, you know micro uh, micron level resolution uh, X-ray images uh, that are uh, you know, derived from a very high energy single light source, you know, kind of, you know, uh, instrument. So, um, you know, the, uh, if we look at the, uh, the kind of reconstruction, this is a very uh, memory uh, communication uh, sensitive application. So if we use double precision versus single precision versus, uh, you know, mixed uh, precision of, uh, you know, the half precision and a, a single precision, we can, uh, actually, you know, the, uh, uh, reduce the, the uh, total uh, application execution time very, very significantly. So you could go see the data going uh, from left to right. Uh, right. But uh, the main point that I wanted to point out is, uh, you know, the, uh, for each data type, uh, if we use hierarchical communication, that is, uh, the nodes first exchange data and uh, you know, uh, prepare for their uh, you know, the, uh, their global communication uh, by first doing the, all the necessary reductions, we can half the communication uh, the total execution time. And even more importantly, uh, if you look at the communication cost versus computing cost, uh, the communication cost is so high in the direct communication that even if you overlap the communication with computation, it's not going to get you much. However. Uh, you know, once we get down to the, uh, you know, the hierarchical communication with a mixed precision, we are now in a very, uh, you know, the comparable communication versus computation cost that uh, when we overlap the com communication with uh, computation, we can actually get the really uh, you know, much more effective uh, you know, results. So, uh, you know, let me begin to, you know, to uh, venture more into the, uh, the storage side. I really think that uh, we're at the beginning of seeing some really, uh, I would say, uh, golden age of storage, uh, you know, uh, uh, storage for the next decade. So, uh, you know, the, uh, for those of you who, are, who don't deal with storage uh, you know, the, all the time, the storage has been going through, you know, the, some, uh, I would say, uh, Slow but uh, uh, but very uh, you know, uh, uh, meaningful transformations in the uh, in the past couple of decades. So the the use of uh, flash you know the, in SSD has enabled uh, very very large density but uh, uh, fast access. But even more importantly, because SSD consists of a huge number of chips, there is actually a, a, a potentially a very large amount of parallelism that we can uh, achieve compared to the spindle, uh, you know, the technology that we used in the past. So uh, that's why uh, the SSD, you know, the uh, access through the modern standards such as MVME 
uh, are you know designed to enable massive uh, level of parallelism in this inside the storage. So basically, in order to access uh, uh, SSD through the uh, NVMe uh, protocol, um, the CPU uh, or the GPU can prepare uh, what we call the submission queue and the completion queue, and uh, and uh, uh, and make that available to the NVMe controller. So uh, whenever the CPU, let's say, uh, wants to uh, make an access, it will just enter the access into the submission queue. And then uh, the, uh, the command will go into the submission queue, and uh, uh, the NVMe, you know, the, uh, and it rings what we call the doorbell. And uh, this is typically done by mapping the NVMe controller register into the memory map I.O. And then uh, the, uh, the NVMe controller will come back and um, uh, you know, uh, fetch the queue entries and do the accesses and then uh, you know, deliver the uh, results into the I.O. buffer and then uh, you know, does, and put a entry into the uh, completion queue and then ring the doorbell and, uh, and that's it. So, so the, you know, there's some uh, interesting you know, uh, properties that we're, uh, we can see in the, in the NVMe uh, standard. Uh, the standard is very much uh, designed to provide parallelism. And uh, so uh, there are three main types of uh, you know, the message queues. For the uh, administration queue, uh, these are the queues to, to do the uh, kind of set up kind of thing. So uh, you, know, there, uh, you can actually have up to 4K of these commands you know, that, that, uh, what, that affect the setting of the uh, I.O. activities. But the, if you look at the submission queue and the completion queue, we can have a large number of these queues, and every one of these queues can have up to 64K elements in the queue. So we can really have a huge number of pending, overlapping pending accesses as far as the standard design is concerned, right, into the uh, storage. So what does this mean? Um, you know, we can potentially begin to think about, you know, uh, we can uh, do much finer grain access to the storage. Today, uh, we typically will have megabytes or more access into the uh, SSD just so that, uh, you know, we can uh, saturate the interconnect bandwidth. And, uh, uh, and also, uh, the, the, in reality, the uh, simultaneous uh, pending access into the storage tend to be somewhat limited. So, uh, the, you know, it, but the problem is a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the accesses tend to be more finer grain and also uh, tend to be sparse and more and more sparse and more and more random uh, you know, the, because of the needs of machine train, uh, 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 learning and analytics. So if, uh, if we go down to, let's say, four uh, uh, kilobyte granularity, assuming this future, you know, the near future 300 gigabyte per second link available to the storage. Then each transfer only will occupy that uh, link by about uh, uh, 0.0133 microsecond. And um, so if you compare that to a typical read, uh, write latency to the SSD, to a high-end SSD today under normal uh, load, we're talking about somewhere around 60 microsecond of uh, nominal latency into the, these you know, the SSDs. So basically, we will need to sustain at least 6,000 overlapping pending accesses in order to be able to, you know, to do some of the things that uh, Sarita was talking about without having to, you know, to, to do the, uh, a lot of the magic in the host memory. So the CPUs can potentially allow hundreds of these pending accesses. And typically what happens is that you will have one pending access uh, uh, per core or a small number of pending access per core. And then uh, if you have a large number of cores, you can have you know, maybe up to you know, a small number of hundred of pending accesses from the CPU. GPUs are in, in, uh, intrinsically designed uh, to allow more uh, pending accesses even in its page fault handling uh, your know, request. So if you look at the GPU architecture, they can uh, potentially allow tens of thousands of pending accesses. So there's a great match here 
in terms of the accesses that we can, you know, the issue to the uh, to the storage to the NVMe. However, the current PCIe uh, Gen three uh, Gen four five standard only allow up to a thousand and twenty four pending accesses. So that's where the real bottleneck will be in terms of how many pending accesses there will be, you know, the, uh, into these storages. So we will need to have new file system infrastructure and enhanced interconnect standards. And uh, we can probably imagine that NVLink will uh, alleviate these kind of limitations, uh, you know, in their uh, uh, next uh, version. So, so that's the file uh, access. And uh, well, we can also em envision at some point, the storage could be used as memory, flat memory. And uh, so you know, the, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, you know, the, some of the students and uh, uh, Jin Jun and uh, Jian Huan and me, uh, uh, Nansung Kim, you know, with uh, together, uh, Nansung is currently at uh, uh, Samsung working on the, uh, their next generation uh, you know, uh, HBM uh, technology. So you know, the, we, uh, we published a paper on flat flash and this, we asked this question. We said, uh, what does it take to be able to, you know, to, to have direct cache line access into the SSD so that we don't have to you know, the, suffer the, uh, you know, the IO amplification and also the, in some cases the uh, thrashing effect of bringing uh, non-reuse data uh, in and out of the DRAM. So you know, the, we actually you know, the, uh, you know, the, uh, show that the, there's some very interesting uh, you know, uh, opportunities and so on. But um, uh, just to summarize, uh, the persist, you know, we can, uh, once we have this capability, we can begin to persist language level objects and, uh, uh, into, so that we don't have to reconstruct these objects uh, you know, in and out of the file system. And we can further eliminate uh, you know, the, the vast majority of the IO amplification. But the mass you know, the storage uh, memory that uh, support fine grain what uh, you know, typically be used for sparse data accesses and randomized accesses. If you still have very dense accesses, you may as well go back to the, you know, the, to the page level or even the, uh, you know, the, the large page size uh, model access. But the, the challenge here is kind of interesting. Assuming that the cache line of 128 bytes granularity and uh, still the 80 nanosecond latency by the way, uh, this number could go down to as low as about 10 uh, micro, not, uh, this is 80 microsecond latency. And uh, uh, you know, it could go down to about 10 microsecond or so for, the, uh, you know, for, for some of the higher end uh, you know, the, uh, uh, cross point kind of ag uh, technology from Micron and Intel. Uh, but the capacity of those ag uh, you know, technologies will be much lower. And still the order of magnitude will be the same. So uh, we will have to have 200,000 overlapping pending accesses in order to really saturate a, uh, you know, the, uh, a 300 gigabyte per second uh, uh, bandwidth. So you know, the CPU architectures will allow very, very small number of pending access into the memory, less than 100. And uh, in the Volta generation GPU, uh, we, can, you know, the, uh, we can enable up to about uh, 4,000 accesses. So, so uh, you know, uh, it is still not quite you know, the large enough to really saturate the next generation. So you know, the, we will have quite a bit of uh, things to go. I think I'm going to, uh, not going to go into this uh, in, in great detail, but I just want to show quickly that uh, uh, you know, we can, if we really, really need to touch very sparse uh, you know, in a very sparse pattern, huge amount of uh, data in the storage so that we can do real-time response on the, some of these uh, you know, the data verific uh, database, uh, you know, uh, data access-based corroboration you know, during inference time, we will need to place some of these compute into the, uh, the, the controllers of the flash memory at different levels in order to be able to, you know, the, to get the, the performance we need. So uh, I want to summarize, and uh, so so that we don't go over time. Uh, the modern SSD standards, such as NVMe, 
can potentially allow massive parallelism, and uh, uh, you know, the, you can uh, enable the software to do you know very uh, you know the uh, novel latency tolerance techniques. But uh, uh, and the, you can e even enable some fine grain accesses to you know the, to reduce the IO amplification. However, it does need to uh, need to uh, uh, the, the new uh, you will need new interconnect capabilities and the. GPU interconnect uh, bandwidth approach currently can you know uh, can approach the current memory uh, GP CPU memory bandwidth. So in order to really harvest these new capabilities, uh, we do need to uh, you know, uh, begin to elevate the uh, system architecture and the software infrastructure. So we need to you know begin to uh, to uh, update. Most of our communication mechanisms into uh, uh, hierarchical communication, and we need to uh, you know uh, enable uh, you know massive number of pending accesses through the entire access path, and uh, most notably the interconnect uh, limitations and the uh, CPU GPU microarchitecture allowance of pending accesses uh, into the physical address space. And uh, ultimately, in-store compute may be necessary for scanning through a very large data set with short latency uh, during inference time. So that concludes the talk, and I, uh, you know, the, uh, I will be very happy to entertain any questions or discussion. Um, thank you very much, Professor Wenmei. Um, other questions for Professor Wenmei? <clears throat> I wanted to ask one question. Uh, hi, hi, Professor Vanme. Um, hi. So, so uh, I think this is a very interesting talk and very revealing in terms of what is happening on the on the hardware side and in terms of the uh, bandwidths and the interconnect speeds. So, I wanted to ask a generic question like, how do you see what is the implication of this on the on the algorithms above, right, on the algorithmic side? For example. Because you talked about fatter nodes and maybe uh, the lower, I mean, in terms of the internode communication, maybe the bottleneck. So you talked about hierarchical communication, but do you see uh, more and more like asynchronous kind of algorithms or loosely coupled, uh, uh, you know, loosely coupled kind of computations becoming more common because of this trend? Uh, what's the implication? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because uh, uh, what what's happening is that um, uh, you you can. You really want to be able to uh, make progress locally as much as possible, right? Uh, so, you know, the, uh, you, if you have an algorithm that truly requires global, <laughs> you know, the synchronized uh, you know, data change, uh, you know, those algorithms will begin to fall, you know, fall behind, uh, you know, the, you know, I would say, you know, <laughs> extremely significant ways. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, the uh, from algorithm point of view. We still have a lot of uh, you know, uh, uh, data frames, uh, the, uh, you know, data management like frameworks, and so on, that actually load very big chunk of data into the host memory and do all kinds of you know, the things such as compression, decompression, you know, sorting, right, and uh, you know, uh, uh, randomized ordering, and uh, so uh, those are the kind of things that uh, you know, will likely become uh, you know, the obsolete because of these changes. And um, so, you know, the Spark, for example, you know, the, when it comes to the, some of the uh, map reduced phases, I predict that some of these algorithms are also change, you know, the, because of this gen, uh, you know, the uh, evolution. Right. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. So I have a question. If nobody else has a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Wenme, you touched a little bit about uh, federated learning. Now that m many organizations want to keep their data themselves and uh, still want to share insights to learn models, right? So, yeah. Uh, uh, these advances in hardware, the bottleneck will be the inter data center connections between organizations, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think has to be done to address those challenges? Um, yeah. Both from yeah. Connection standpoint and maybe from better scheduling at the data yeah. in, inside the data center. 
Yeah. So uh, uh, I have a colleague of mine, uh, you know, Andrew Miller, who you know, the, who has been teaching me about some of these things. You know, the, uh, it's actually a really, really hard problem. So uh, the the problem is that uh, if you look at the typical uh, multi-party computing you know, the, uh, you know, the platforms that people use, you know, if you go to the uh, the uh, where the data is because they are spread across data centers and even in some devices. These things, you know, the, we're talking about uh, you know, incredibly long, you know, the over the big overhead and latency. We're talking about thousands of times of the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the compute. So, so uh, the I think the general trend is going to be some kind of trusted platform for the user to, you know, to have encrypted data, you know, the, uh, moved into the uh, the data center, and that data should not be decrypted uh, all the way into the processor. And then uh, you, know, the, you need to have an infrastructure to destroy that data you know, uh, after the training. At least you can aggregate the data into the same data center. But mm -hmm. this in itself is going to be you know, a big challenge. Intel, you know, uh, Intel is, you know, the, has this you know, new, you know, new way to go all the way up to the, uh, you know, the cache, right? But then, uh, but we're talking about something probably even more than that. We're probably talking yeah. about, the, you know, uh, about privacy all the way to the register level, right? <laughs> so, so, so that, that that's something that uh, will keep the security people employed for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you, 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 were you referring to SGX uh, in that case? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But I think it's a great step, but it's not going to be sufficient uh, still. So we still have more advancement to go. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, any other questions thank for you. Professor Rene? Okay. In that case, thank you very much, Professor Rene. We are privileged to have you here, and uh, thanks very much for a great talk. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, now, can you start sharing your screen, please? Yep. No, no, Saffron. Um, or... Oh, hi. Yeah, so can you hear me? I can hear you. You can start sharing your screen. Yeah, sure. So, our uh, next speaker is now Safran Sattar, who is a PhD student in computer science at the University of New Orleans. Um, she uh, is working in the, uh, she's working as a graduate assistant in the big data and scalable computing research under uh, Professor Sheikh Arifu Zaman. And uh, uh, she's going to uh, be talking about, uh, she's going to be talking about uh, uh, data parallel, large scale, sparse, uh, deep neural networks on GPUs. Go ahead now. Hi, thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. Today, uh, I am going to talk, uh, present our work Data parallel, large, sparse, deep neural network on GPUs. So, it is a